Hi, Sam here for Lick Library and welcome to this free guitar lesson on the playing style and habits of the amazing Jason Becker. In this guitar lesson, I want to break down some of Jason Becker's techniques that he'll use on guitar in order to move around the fretboard with arpeggios. I'd also like to look at some compositional approaches and also some of the diverse range of tonalities that he pulls from. There's a lot that I'd like to reflect on about Jason Becker's playing and uh, I've also done a reaction video for Lick Library just reflecting on Jason Becker's career, uh, his life and uh, his output and some of the notable videos that inspired me so you can check that out in one of the links. In this video I'm going to talk about the technical aspects of Jason Becker's playing which have inspired me on my own journey and hopefully they help you. So without further ado, grab your guitar and we'll dive in. Jason Becker was a young, sprightly lad, recording at the time of the 80s with all of the other shred giants, very inspired by Yngwie Malmsteen and classical music. And of course, you can hear this in his composition and playing, and most players around the 80s were using arpeggios and sweep picking, but I don't feel like they were doing it quite the same as Jason. Jason was doing these huge rolling waterfall-like sweeps around really beautiful chord changes and he would double track them and harmonize them and do counterpoint sweeps underneath and you get really creative with it. It wasn't just a technique like it can be. Um, obviously it takes a precedent, it, it's very impressive sounding on the guitar when played really well, but it was definitely a device in Jason's playing in order to create another texture. So let's just look at the guitar neck a little bit closer and I'll talk about why Jason's arpeggios were a little bit different than the conventional sweep picking licks of the 80s. So conventionally, most players in the 80s were doing smaller sweeps of maybe three strings, like that. So an A minor pattern here, we have nine on the G, 10 on the B, eight, 12 on the high E. And they would be played in sequence. Occasionally, there'd be an addition of the A and D string, so you'd have the 12th fret on the A, 10th fret on the D, and that would give you two octaves of an A minor arpeggio in this particular position. But this would be done more as a kind of run up to a top note like this. So it's more like a, a kind of a momentary thing, which is really cool. The kind of sweeping that you would hear people like Ingve doing would be these three string sequences moving through inversions. So that's just A minor in three different positions up and down the neck. Jason would actually use the five string shapes and extend them lower down and sometimes even go to six strings and he would have different combinations and different patterns and some of them I can't quite play in the same fingering as he did. He had some amazing stuff he could do. But here I want to just share the concept of taking one tonality and then finding the inversions. So he might start something like this, A minor. So that'll be starting from that 7th fret on the A string, hammering on to 12 on the A, and then 10 on the D, 9 on the G, 10 on the B, and then 8 and 12 on the high E. With a hammer on and pull off there. So that'd be one, two, three, four, five, six, two, two, three, four, five, six. Then he would replace, this is a, something Tom Quayle I've noticed called compression. So we've gone from the little finger ending and we're actually gonna swap over now to the index finger on the 12th fret and we can play the inversion uh, of the A minor arpeggio. And that'll be 12, 15 on the A, 14 on the D and G, then 13 on the B, then 12 and 17 on a high E. And of course, what you might notice with these patterns is there's two notes on either string, so on the A string and the E string as a turnaround. Sometimes Jason would take the kind of Ingve approach where he would actually go one note, two notes, one note, one note, two notes. which means he could sequence the lower part of it. And he's taught that in some of his early clinics. There's probably some 
clips on YouTube of him talking about that particular method with his arpeggios. Now, if you know your cage system, if you know how to find your chord shapes, all around the neck, that's just all A minor, with <laughs> the wrong tone, of course, but you can actually turn any of them into these arpeggio shapes. It does take a bit of getting used to with the picking on the picking hand. So we're going to do, for the first shape, you do down hammer, and then you're doing down, 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 up, pull. We're doing up on the B, up, up, and then down again. So. And continuing on. This is a, quite a tricky shape. You've got 15, 19 on the A, a rolling bar of the third finger on the D string, and then you've got 15, sorry, 17, sorry, on G, B, and E, and then you've got uh, 20 on the top E string. So. And that's the shapes, and, and often at the top and bottom of these, and you can hear this actually in Jeff Loomis's playing, he's very inspired by Jason and Marty Friedman's particular sweet picking thing. You might take these five strings and sequence the top three strings within that. So going all the way up, and then back down to the G string, and then up again kind of using that as a way of rolling around within that one inversion. You can do it with each of the patterns if you want. Now something else that made Jason Becker's sweep picking stand out is he wasn't afraid to do it with a metal tone. I'm going with very high gain tone here, but on the bridge pickup. And this can be difficult with sweep picking because it can, uh, it doesn't sound as smooth if, if you're not careful. With a heavy palm mute on top. And ensuring that you're getting a nice bit of um, clarity there within the, the sweep. I'm not digging in too hard, but I'm being firm enough that the notes do pop into the palm mute as I play. And that's the way, that's the only way I can get it sounding a little bit like Jason Becker, but Jason is obviously the master at that. Practicing is triplets or 16th notes. Uh, with a metronome nice and slow, making sure the pick is resting on the next string as you go down. So once I've played the A there, for example, it's resting on the D. Just ensuring those aspects of the technique are together will hopefully help you get closer to the sound that Jason gets. So the next thing I'd like to talk about is once you've got these interesting arpeggio patterns under your fingers, then it's about actually having some interesting harmony to be able to play this over. And Jason's compositional skills, I think, uh, probably some of the highest compositional skills of that era of shred guitar playing. He was really into counterpoint, some of the classical composers, and really taking apart harmony in an interesting kind of neoclassical way, but with a heavy edge. And I think Marty Friedman also had a big influence in him. I think they heavily influenced each other when they were working together in Cacophony. Now, one of the things that I've picked up through Jason, but also through some of the people he's inspired, such as Jeff Loomis, Jason Richardson, and many others, is his use of altering certain chords from the major scale. There's lots of theoretical angles we can come at this from, but a nice simple one, and this is my layman's guide to changing your harmony, is you take a key, for example, A major, and then you take a strong chord movement in there, and uh, then you change one of the notes in the chord that you've moved to. So for example, in the key of A major, you would have these following diatonic chords, A, B minor, C minor, D, E, F sharp minor, and then you'd have a, an A flat, uh, G sharp, sorry, that's technically correct because of the enharmonics. A flat diminished and an A. Um, 
G sharp diminished. Sorry. <laughs> and um, basically, that, that that four chord. So the four chord and there's D major. We go four notes up the major scale. Becomes D. Now, if we make that into D minor, when we go between. That's the classic one. Here we're going to make it minor this time. Now, if you start doing inversions, I'm going to go back to A again. Back to D minor. That's probably not the most Jason Becker sounding example, but hopefully you can hear that kind of more soundtracky harmony going on. So that's one way of breaking up your conventional harmony, just changing the diatonic chords, major or minor. But you can also go up in thirds and minor thirds within the key and then put a minor or major chord in there. You could go, I need to see if I can do this. Uh, you could go A major and then C sharp major. And then C sharp minor to the original one, to F sharp minor, and then G. So these are sort of odd movements, but you'll hear this all over Jason Becker's solo stuff, and you'll hear it in his metal writing with cacophony as well. Talking of which, let's talk about Jason's use of interesting scales. <laughs> So right there I was playing some symmetrical scale material and this is something you hear a lot in Jason's riff writing and playing. You'll go from these very conventional harmonic situations, even using some of those chromatic mediants from before and things like that, just manoeuvres to help expand upon more emotive harmony. But then there will also be these really dark heavy moments and it might be that Marty Friedman, who was really into his exotic scales, he was kind of making these Japanese pentatonics and other things like that, which I'm actually going to attribute more to Marty in this particular video, because I want to talk about more the dissonant stuff that Jason did as well. But of course, uh, honourable mention is that Japanese pentatonic scale, and there was several different iterations of it. There was the, uh, the minor one with the fl flat six. <laughs> So that was like an A. There's a name for it in Japanese and I can't pronounce it. So I'm just going to say it's the, the Japanese sounding one that uh, they say it sounds Japanese. So, so that's five, seven, eight on the E and then seven, eight on the A. And often that would be taken up an octave. So that'll work over A minor and you would have Sometimes a flat five in there as well. Sometimes that'll be thrown in. Sometimes it'll be incorporated with the natural minor scale or harmonic minor scales. There's also variations of this or combinations. Uh, another really common one is this one. So that'd be seven, eight on the low E string. And then we'd have seven, nine, 10 on the A. Kind of create some cool ideas of that. You could actually combine those notes together with the first three notes of that A minor one. So you've got in, in intervals, you've got one, two, flat three, five, six, flat seven. So kind of getting those sounds and making riffs or using it as licks within solos. But the scale I often heard Jason using was the half whole diminished scale, which is used a lot in jazz, but it's brilliant for metal and loads of like death metal stuff uses it. If you listen to anything from, you know, like Decapitated or Faceless, that sort of stuff, Black Dahlia Murder, some of the heavier, more esoteric sounding riffs um, you'll hear the half hole being used a lot. The half hole scale is simply just a half step and a 
whole step, just going up. And there's a position you can do. So to play the half whole uh, scale in C sharp like I did in the recording, we've got uh, four, five, seven on the A. Then you have three, five, six on the D. Then you have three, four, six on the G. Then three, five, six on the B. And then three, four, six on the top E. So. And there's another position of this you can learn, but I'm quite lazy, as probably most of you can tell. And you can just invert this in minor thirds. Quite simple, really. Why do too much when you can just do what you need to do? So um, that's going to go on my gravestone, maybe. Who knows? Um, but basically, we're going to take this, and then we can move it down a half step. And it sounds quite quite mysterious and mean when you move it around in half steps. And it's great, and then you can under I underline that with... And that's something else Jason and Marty did a lot in a Cacophony, was these fifth-rooted power chords, which, that's a bonus tip. Throw in fifth-rooted power chords and you're good to go. This is my beloved Jason Becker mug. His father, Gary Becker, does these, these awesome drawings. And uh, this was actually a gift from Jason's family when I did some fundraising work for him and his family many years ago. And uh, since then, the guitar community has really got together in supporting him. And you can find out more information about how to support Jason in one of the links below. So I hope you've enjoyed this free guitar lesson on the playing style and habits of the amazing Jason Becker. Of course, this is just a technical scan of just some of the stuff that I've found very useful in my own playing and exploration. If you enjoyed this video, hit the like button, subscribe and hit the bell notification so you can be notified when Lick Library uploads another free guitar lesson. Let us know in the comments some of your favourite aspects of Jason Becker and Marty Friedman's playing and I'd love to hear from you and have a discussion about the amazing Jason Becker. If you'd like to take your guitar playing to the next level, Lick Library is the place to be. There are tons of courses on artists, technique, concepts and tone and much more available as part of the membership. We're updating the website of lots of courses every month and you can also get one-to-one -one mentorship as part of your monthly membership so do check it out in the link below thanks for watching and we'll see you soon